Luke 12, 54 through 56. Then he also said to the multitudes, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, A shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not discern this time? Jesus was rebuking the multitudes for not recognizing the times they were living in. Jesus, the promised Messiah, was standing right there before them, and they didn't even know it. If the multitudes of Jesus' day missed Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to discern the times we live in and make sure we don't miss the signs of his second coming? Are you discerning the times? Jesus is returning. Are you ready? One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! and I don't want you to go there. We've been reporting on the bizarre phenomenon that seems to be taking place not just in this country, but all over the world. Getting angry at God isn't going to solve anything. Don't put dad me, young lady. I just said you can see that boy when we get to church. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Breaking news, there appears to be a rash of catastrophic incidents taking place across the state. Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then Jesus said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. This has been a very spectacular day of a catastrophe after the other. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So robes and positions and titles and classifications and auxiliaries and departments and works and paying your tithe and paying your dues will not save you. We are still experiencing the aftershocks of the massive earthquake that have devastated this entire region. If you want to be raptured, you must be born again. Citizen of the South Korea, we're here one moment and going the next. You must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. It's over! We've all been left behind. <laughs> it's going to be joyful for those who are raptured, but it's going to be sad. For those who are left behind. Life! Life as we know it! You swore to me that you were going to get yourself together and start coming to church with me. Not today, okay? I'll go with you next Sunday. Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is $Watchman1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. An ABC News exclusive. We're taking you inside the future of artificial intelligence with the CEO of the company behind ChatGPT. 
Rebecca Jarvis back with the interview. Hey, Rebecca. Hey, George. And it, this whole thing is pretty mind blowing. The possibilities here are endless. The creators of ChatGPT believe it can help solve problems like climate change and transform everything from our health care to our education and even make completing everyday tasks much easier. But of course, there are downsides too, and we got into all of it. This morning, an exclusive look inside of OpenAI, the company behind the groundbreaking artificial intelligence chatbot that everyone is talking about, ChatGPT. Showing up now. I spoke to OpenAI CEO Sam Altman inside of their San Francisco headquarters on the day they released their latest version, GPT-4, which can write essays and speeches, offer logical reasoning, analyze pictures, and even take tests outperforming most humans, scoring in the 90th percentile on the uniform bar exam and 700 on the SAT math portion. What changes because of artificial intelligence? Part of the exciting thing here is we, we get continually surprised by the creative power of, of all of society. I think that word surprise, though, it's both exhilarating as well as terrifying That's to for people. Sure. I think people should be happy that we're a little bit scared of this. I think people should be You're happy. a little bit scared. A little bit, yeah, You personally. Course. If I said I were not, you should either not trust me or be very unhappy I'm in this job. Chief Technology Officer Mira Marathi showed us how it can help with your taxes. We input information for a typical family of three. So you're copying tax law, just multiple pages of tax mm -hmm. law. And within seconds, the standard deduction. GPT-4 says it's $24,000. Which was correct. And it even identified a picture of a dog and was able to recognize the dog was probably hungry. Watch as we take a photo of what's inside this refrigerator. The technology analyzes what's there. I see that you have some bread, some mozzarella cheese, mm -hmm. tomatoes, and mayonnaise. You can make a simple grilled cheese sandwich with these ingredients. You can make a strawberry toast by spreading the raspberry fruit spread on the bread and topping it with sliced strawberries. Perfect. Providing a recipe. But is this also a recipe for something else? On the one hand, there's all of this potential for good. On the other hand, there's a huge number of unknowns that could turn out very badly for society. How confident are you that what you've built won't lead to those outcomes. Well, we'll adapt it. You'll adapt it as negative things occur? For sure, for sure. The current systems are still weak relative to what we expect to create. And so putting these systems out now, while the stakes are fairly low, learning as much as we can, I think is how we avoid the more dangerous scenarios. Is there a kill switch, a way to shut the whole thing down? Any engineer can just say like, we're gonna disable this for now. The model itself, can it take the place of that human? Could it become more powerful than that human? It waits until someone gives it an input. This is a tool that is very much in human control. All right, why proceed now then? That is the question. Well, there is an AI arms race already underway. Russia's President Putin has said whoever leads in this technology controls the future of the world. That is a chilling statement. China is developing its own version, and Sam Altman told me that he is in regular contact with the U.S. government talking about all of this. And I even asked him, is the U.S. government, do they understand? Are they fully aware? And he said they're getting up to speed more and more every day. So he says he's scared. Does that mean he's actually put limits on the technology so far? Huge numbers of limits. And each day, they input more limits. And George, one of the points here with already putting this out to the public is that they need to understand how people interact with the technology to understand what limits to add to the technology. Now, that's a little scary because obviously bad things can happen. No, and we've, talked about, right. we've talked about some of those things here already. But his point is, until you see how humans interact, you will not fully understand the behavior of this technology and where it's going. And, and even today, just to look at it, even what's known about it, there are still tons of unknowns about what it's gonna do in the future. Yeah, interesting, but still scary, yeah. is yeah. right. People should be happy that we're a little bit scared of this. I think people should be You're happy. a little bit scared. A little bit, yeah, You personally. Course. If I said I were not, you should either not trust me or be very unhappy I'm in this job. In the 1984 sci-fi film, The Terminator, a cyborg killer robot from the future comes to execute Sarah Connor whose unborn son helps humanity overcome an artificial intelligence system known as Skynet. With the rapid advance of AI technology worldwide, could killer robots pose a threat to the future existence of the human race? 
Recent advances in artificial intelligence now available to the masses have both fascinated and enthralled many Americans. But amid all the wows over AI, there are some saying, wait, including a pair of former Silicon Valley insiders who are now warning tech companies there may be no returning the AI genie to the bottle. It's hard to believe it's only been four months since ChatGPT launched, kicking the AI arms race into high gear. That was like firing the starting gun, that now all the other companies said, well, if we don't also deploy, we're going to lose the race to Microsoft. Tristan Harris is Google's former design ethicist. He co-founded the Center for Humane Technology with Azo Raskin. Both see in AI welcome possibilities. What we want is AI that enriches our lives, that is helping us cure cancer, that is helping us find climate solutions. But will the new AI arms race take us there or down a darker path? The race to deploy becomes the race to recklessness because they can't deploy it that quickly and also get it right. In the 2020 Netflix doc, The Social Dilemma, they sounded the alarm on the dangers of social media. We built these things and we have a responsibility to change it. But tonight, they have an even more dire warning about ignoring the perils of artificial intelligence. It would be the worst of all human mistakes to have ever been made. And we literally don't know how it works and we don't know all the things it will do. And we're, we're putting it out there before we actually know whether it's safe. Raskin points to a recent survey of AI researchers, where nearly half said they believe there's at least a 10% chance AI could eventually result in an extremely bad outcome, like human extinction. Where do you come down on that? I don't know. The, the, the no, point that's, is... That scares me you don't know. Yeah. Well, right. here's, here's the point. Like, it's, it's, imagine you're about to get on an airplane and 50% of the engineers um, that built the airplane say there's a 10% chance that the airplane might crash uh, and kill everyone. Leave me at the gate. Right, yeah, exactly. AI tools can already mimic voices, ace exams, create art, and diagnose diseases. And they're getting smarter every day. In two years, by the time of the election, Human beings will not be able to tell the difference between what is real and what is fake. Who's building the guardrails here? No one is building the guardrails. And this has moved so much faster than our government has been able to understand or appreciate. It's important to note the CEOs of the major AI labs, and they've all said we do need to regulate AI. There's always that notion that, well, maybe these companies can police themselves. Does that work? No. No. Self-policing doesn't work. No. no, it cannot work. But doesn't a person ultimately control it? Can I simply just pull the plug? Unfortunately, this is being decentralized into more and more hands. So the technology isn't just run inside of one company that you can just say, I'm going to pull the plug on Google. Also, think about how hard it would be to pull the plug on Google or pull the plug on Microsoft. So what would you tell a CEO of a Silicon Valley company right now? In, yeah, you don't want to be last, but can you take a pause? I mean, is that realistic? You, no, it's, you, you're right. It's not realistic to ask one company. What we need to do is get those companies have to come together in a constructive, positive dialogue about, think of it like, you know, the nuclear test ban treaty, right? We, we cut all the nations together saying, can we agree we don't want to deploy nukes above ground? The stakes, they say, are impossibly high. But when we're, we're in an arms race to deploy AI to every human being on the planet as fast as possible with as little testing as possible, that's not an equation that's going to end well. In the last days, the book of Daniel prophesied that knowledge would increase. Daniel 12.4 But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Knowledge had to increase for future prophecy to be fulfilled. The biblical knowledge we have today is because of the increase in technology. This is a pretty good indicator that Christ will return very soon. There are many prophecies in Daniel's time that could not come to fulfillment because the technology had not yet been invented. That is why Daniel was told to shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. One of those prophecies is found in Matthew 24, verses 21 and 22. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Flesh is the Greek word sarx, which means flesh, body, human nature, especially a human being. Matthew 24, 22 can be translated like this. And unless those days were shortened, no human nature would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. If Jesus did not return and shorten the days, there would be no human nature saved. 
either mankind will merge with artificial intelligence or artificial intelligence will completely destroy mankind as the dominant species. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. John 15, 18 through 20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9, and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9 Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12 But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Check out this video from a Christian church service in China. It shows worshipers being raided by Chinese Communist Party police as part of the government's crackdown on Christianity. One Chinese pastor who fled to America is now warning that scenes like this are strikingly similar to the way the left censors speech here in the U.S. Bob Fu is that pastor and the president of China Aid, a watchdog group that tracks the religious persecution in China and joins me now. Bob, thank you so much for getting up with us and being here to talk with us about this this morning, but you have a very stark warning for America, what is it? Because uh, I was uh, born, raised, educated and uh, communist China. I just observed uh, uh, striking similarities during this uh, COVID uh, dictatorship time uh, between China, of course, even the United States of America. I find uh, we are really in America descending into a very a uh, dark uh, kind of uh, reality that uh, somehow those uh, mayors and uh, uh, governors all of a sudden became little emperors, and uh, and also the media uh, has become a, a ideological tool to do propaganda with one side of the uh, extreme leftist agenda. That's very worrisome to me, and um, we. Uh, cannot really uh, make our exceptionalist, uh, const you know, constitutional democracy uh, into this uh, communist uh, style of governance. Um, that's worried me to the most. We have seen, of course, uh, the persecuted church in China, as you just shown. Uh, every day, uh, many of my friends, I mean, are arrested and serving five years, seven years, nine years imprisonment uh, for simply preaching the gospel and uh, uh, organize a peaceful worship service every Sunday. Now, I mean, all of a sudden, uh, we could not uh, tolerate um, the worship. I mean, uh, at, uh, if you are in defiance of a little emperor, uh, mayor, or governor's ordinance, and uh, who would ordain, uh, order you uh, how and when, uh, where to worship. I mean, uh, so this is uh, certainly the most worrisome thing. I uh, feel that America is unfortunately, uh, including Canada and other European countries, are coming to this point of uh, active discrimination and perhaps a persecution on the door. You talk about the future and you worry about what's going to happen. And obviously in COVID, they made it so hard for people just to go to church, um, as you called them, little emperors is, is what you referred to them as. So do you think that these far left figures, whether it be politicians or people that just follow this ideology, do you think they understand the repercussions that follow by doing this? I actually, not only I feel they understand, um, they are adopting Adopting the similar or same tactics, same playbook from the Chinese Communist. I, I feel in that way the Communist Party actually has uh, 
uh, successfully um, uh, penetrating or exporting these tactics, uh, because it's all a matter of uh, total control. It's a matter of power uh, uh, over the church and uh, those uh, mayors or uh, governors, uh, such as in California, I mean, uh, they just uh, want to be uh, the Lord over the church and uh, over uh, the um, uh, people of faith, I mean, um, in the name of the COVID. So I think uh, that is um, the, the key, um, that uh, the American Christians should be prepared uh, for the kind of persecution the uh, Chinese Christians, Saudi Arabian Christians, or North Korean Christians may have been facing. Um, so we need to be prepared. How can Americans who do not adhere to these practices of being progressive and trying to censor everyone for everything they want to say or do, how can they push back on this? The um, most important thing to push back is uh, we need to really honor the Lord as Christ uh, and uh, the only Lord um, over the church, uh, not any political party, not any political figure, not any ideology, a uh, political ideology can drive us. So we need to stand firm on the rock of our faith in Christ. Um, otherwise, yeah, uh, if we are accommodating, if we are uh, yield, uh, yielding our faith and uh, even a little uh, bit, uh, then the politicians, uh, those other forces, would want to replace that. Mm -hmm. And then our faith will be compromised. I think uh, we will have a, a horrible time, I mean, not only for us, but for our children and our next generation. I hope you see where this is all going. After giving this some serious thought, we must understand that it is Christ's followers who are in the way. This is the future the Bible has been warning about. We have arrived. The Christian persecution the church is suffering right now, awful as it is, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, the greatest political leader in the history of mankind will take the world stage. He will launch a military campaign that will result in his acquiring authority over all peoples of the earth as we read in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His empire will be the most extensive in all of history, encompassing the entire world, and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will appear to be the savior of the world, but as he consolidates his power, his true nature will be revealed. He will emerge as a Satan-possessed and empowered person who hates God and is determined to annihilate Christianity. His method of eliminating Christians will be by beheading as we read in Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshiped the beast, or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. For this reason, he is identified in Scripture as the Antichrist, as we read in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. To the aftermath of the deadly storm in California that brought heavy rain, snow, mudslides, and even tornadoes. Rob Marciano is in Montebello, California, where one of those twisters touched down. It's been a, a surreal couple of days here in California where a Pacific storm hit us like a hurricane and not one but two tornadoes hit this state. One right here in Los Angeles, less than eight miles from where the Lakers play. This is an industrial area. You see what this tree did to this wrought iron fence. It, the buildings here have been red flagged. So we got our drone up. It's a little dark, but you can see 17 buildings here damaged. Some badly. Most of them, the, the roofs completely ripped off. There was one person that was injured, and this, the strongest tornado to hit LA Metro in 40 years. Dangerous pieces of debris being hurled through the air. Oh. After two rare tornadoes touched down in California, one just east of Los Angeles, shredding up roofs. Near the Santa Barbara coast, a confirmed tornado picking up and tossing pieces of damaged homes. Yo! At least five weather-related deaths, four from falling trees. Rescuers racing to free the driver and passenger of this white pickup after a massive tree came crashing down. The ground saturated, roots giving way. Watch as this car narrowly misses a tree slamming down on top of it. 
people picking up and cleaning up what they can. And what were you feeling and thinking when, when it was coming through? You could see the oak swaying. They were going like back and forth about 12 feet range from the top bedroom window that I could see, and it was uh, loud. Mudslides in Colfax nearly swallowing this home. As far as tornadoes in California are concerned, we do average five or six a year, but to get two on the same day and one this strong to L.A., that is rare, and we are very lucky that no lives were lost. Tornadoes in California were all saying how it just doesn't even sound, sound possible. The winter storm shattered daily rainfall records in several California cities as communities dealt once again with the impact of that rain, including landslides. In the Central Valley, 24,000 homes and buildings are at risk of flooding from the nearby swollen river and lake in Tulare County. Some 800 homes have already been damaged, some destroyed. We were not prepared. Um, we do not have flood insurance. We already got our denial letter. When we did buy this house, it was not a flood zone, so we didn't, we didn't think we needed it. A Pakistani news anchor continued delivering the day's top stories as an earthquake rocked the nation. Other employees can be seen walking behind the anchor, presumably heading towards safety. Outside the studio, a 6.5 magnitude earthquake struck both Pakistan and neighboring Afghanistan. Tremors were felt more than 600 miles away from the epicenter, according to the European Mediterranean Seismological Center. The U.S. Geological Survey says the quake was felt over a wide area because it began very deep, 116 miles below the Earth's surface. At least 10 deaths have been reported in Afghanistan due to this earthquake, and at least nine more in Pakistan. Authorities in both countries say children are among the dead. The number of casualties and injuries are expected to rise as rescue efforts are now underway. There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24:8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21:28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. Another eight cases of Marburg virus have been confirmed by the World Health Organization in Equatorial Guinea. That brings the total number of cases in the country to nine since an outbreak was first declared in February. At least five people have also died of the disease in Tanzania. The cases were confirmed in new regions of the country, indicating a wider outbreak. There are no vaccines or antiviral treatments approved to treat the severe viral fever, and that's fueling fears it could spread further in the region, with alarms sounding in Cameroon and Kenya. The Marburg virus disease, or MVD, is a rare hemorrhagic fever. It affects both people and non-human primates. It's in the same virus family as Ebola. Marburg has an average fatality rate of 50%, which varies in different strains. In the worst outbreak in Angola in 2005, the fatality rate was 88%. It killed more than 300 people. So we have what seems to be an alarming medical story to share with you tonight. A contagious fungus appears to be spreading through the country. It has what appears to be a very high mortality rate. The fungus is called Candida auris. Cases have more than tripled in recent years. It seems like something out of fiction. Is it a threat to you, to all of us? Tucker, it's not a threat to us yet because it mainly spreads among the immunocompromised in hospitals and nursing homes, and even healthy people can catch it there, but they're not going to get sick. However, it is a growing drug resistance to it, and if it gets invasive and you are immunocompromised, it's 30 to 60 percent fatal. So it's something to really worry about, and CDC is keeping a close eye on it. What protects you? You're warm-blooded. If you're warm-blooded, you can fight off a fungus, and our immune systems fight off a fungus. 
But let's look at ants. There's actually uh, something called zombie ant fungus, believe it or not, that turns ants, these insects, into zombies. And then they go around attacking each other. They're cold-blooded. There's a bat disease now, white nose syndrome in bats, that's killing them yes. off by the droves. The National Science Board of Advisory uh, is warning people that fungus is on their radar. You know what that means? That means if it gets into a lab and somebody's playing around with it in the lab, here we go again with this, it's possible that it will turn into something that could spread, have the mutations, and become a pandemic. That's what I'm most worried about, Tucker, is it being played with in a lab. Is it likely? No. Is it possible? Again, yes. The labs that produce COVID seem pretty unregulated to me. Exactly. Anyway. North Korea. Today, test firing cruise missiles off its east coast in response to what Kim Jong-un sees as growing aggression, his words, from South Korea and its allies. That's coming just days after North Korea simulated a nuclear attack on South Korea Monday. These latest missile launches by North Korea are in response to the biggest war games in the region between the U.S. and South Korea in five years. Our own Josh Letterman is there in the middle of the action, behind the scenes for these live fire exercises with artillery Blackhawk choppers and more. Not far from the North Korean border, U.S. and South Korean troops are practicing for a war they hope they'll never fight. Over 11 days, the two militaries training as one, firing live artillery, flying attack helicopters, and practicing amphibious operations. War games, the U.S. says, are defensive and no threat to North Korea unless it attacks first. The U.S. and South Korea haven't conducted war games on this scale in six years. But after recent North Korean provocations, including just today, military officials say they are more important than ever. Do you feel ready if a conflict were to break out here tonight? 100%. Absolutely. In the middle of today's exercises, North Korea launching multiple cruise missiles into the Sea of Japan a searing reminder of what's at stake. Last year, North Korea test fired more than 70 missiles, the most ever. Recent imagery from North Korean state media suggests the North is using underground silos. Military analysts say that could allow it to launch ballistic missiles with no notice. In the past, this was developmental testing, but now I think they're actually doing exercises. So nuclear warfighting exercises, ballistic missile attack exercises, bomber run exercises. So I don't call these developmental tests anymore. After decades of tensions, the U.S. appears to have largely run out of options to deal with Pyongyang's growing nuclear threat. Well. This South Korean commander says we'll establish a decisive battle posture to fight and win. These military exercises are taking place just 10 miles from the demilitarized zone. North Korea calls them rehearsals for an invasion. Nothing motivates a U.S. soldier to be all they can be more than uh, uh, sleeping 10 miles from uh, an adversary. And when that adversary is firing ballistic missiles, it provides an incredible focus to this training. This week, Kim Jong-un overseeing what North Korea called a simulation of a nuclear counterstrike against U.S. and South Korean forces. For years, we've heard about tensions with North Korea. This has been a pain point for almost every president. Donald Trump took a very different tack than, let's say, Joe Biden, right? Like two very different presidents, two very different attitudes. What is different now, if anything? Well, military officials say, Hallie, that it is different. And it's perhaps not surprising that a lot of people are sort of tuning this out because it feels like it's almost every day that the North right. is testing some type of missile. But in the meantime, what has the North doing? They're testing their Hwasong-17 intercontinental ballistic missile, the largest that they've ever developed. They're using these underground silos that are so hard to detect a potential launch in advance. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, they're also working towards Towards a solid fuel missile, which could be launched really at any time because they don't have to load it up with fuel in advance. So those are very concerning developments in their weapons program. But in the meantime, the North Koreans say, look, you guys are the ones who are 10 miles from our border conducting these huge military war games, the largest in six years. That is something different. They call that a provocation. And just yeah. in the last few hours, Hallie, North Korea has come out saying that any efforts by the United States to try to get them to get rid of their nuclear weapons would be tantamount to a declaration of war. Just hours after Russia and China discussed a peace proposal for Ukraine, Moscow unleashed a new wave of deadly attacks on civilian areas yesterday using missiles and drones. Ukraine's president says Russia is really not interested in ending this conflict. 
conflict, rather. Ramey Innocencio reports from the capital city of Kyiv. This must not become just another day, said Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky. A Russian missile slammed into this apartment block in the southeast city of Zaporizhia, reducing homes to rubble, killing one and injuring dozens. Hours earlier, Russian drones struck the town of Rzhizhiv, about 40 miles south of Kyiv, leaving gaping holes in a college and two dormitories, killing at least nine. This husband and wife inside, fearing they would die. I felt the temperature of my body going up so much that I thought I would burn alive. Across the front lines, Ukraine taking more losses while holding back Russian advances at cost to life and limb. So Everything was on fire. Russian soldiers and our own guys, too, were dead on the ground. People were running. Mines were exploding. The face of Ukrainian soldiers fighting for their lives and country now on the eve of its 14th month. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. We begin, sadly, tragically, with another school shooting, this time in Denver. Police say two school administrators were wounded yesterday by a 17-year-old student who was being searched after previous misbehavior. Officials say that student has since been found dead. Right after the shooting, parents gathered and embraced one another and confronted the city's mayor and police chief. One of the administrators that was shot during the incident was released from the hospital, and the other was listed in critical condition. <laughs> Frightening moments for more than 2,500 students and staff at East High School in Denver yesterday after a shooting on campus. Respond to a gunshot wound with multiple patients. Patients. Police say two staff members, Gerald Mason and Eric Sinclair, were conducting a routine pat-down search of 17-year-old Austin Lyle. When a handgun was discovered in his possession, that's when police say the student shot both men. This particular student actually had a safety plan that was in place where they were to be searched at the beginning of the school day every day. They had been searched uh, previously to, to today and had never had a weapon on them before. School officials have not provided a reason why the teenager required pat-downs other than citing his past behavior, nor have they said how many other students are on a similar safety plan. This is common for all schools in all districts. It's, it's part of what we have in terms of making sure that we can support the needs and behavioral needs of students. At this point, nobody feels safe. Students and parents are demanding answers and action. Okay, we'll answer no more question. meetings, we'll no answer. more words. I appreciate it. We just no more kids marching to your office. Earlier this month, student body president Hadley Hegeseth led a massive student march to the Colorado State Capitol demanding stricter safety rules after 16-year-old student Luis Garcia was shot and killed while sitting in a car outside the school. We marched, we walked. I thought I did everything I could have done as a student. I talked with Senate members um, and it's not enough. With the horrible school shootings, taking place in the United States. We need to answer the question, why do mass shootings keep happening in America? What does this meaningless violence mean? Will it get worse and worse as the time of Christ's return draws near? If we think that things are going to get better and that mankind will solve this problem for less violence, we are fooling ourselves. The Bible indicates otherwise. The simple answer to why do mass shootings keep happening in America is, God is being expelled from the essence of American society. Through Supreme Court decisions starting in 1962, God is being expelled from America. 1962, Engel v. Vital, the removal of prayer in public schools by the Supreme Court. 1963, Abington School District v. Shump, the removal of Bible reading in public schools by the Supreme Court. Contrary to the Lord's commands, America has made it illegal to teach about God and to pray to Him in public schools. Matthew 13, 41, and 42. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom 
all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24 verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.